Good evening once again. It's a pleasure to be back on one of those Thursday evening CCI webinars. And we have a wonderful talk to discuss today. I feel it is a little bit of neglected kind of a talk. And uh, I'm just sharing my screen just to start this presentation in a very, very brief way. I'm not going to talk, give a lecture. But the whole idea that, you know, the the kind of mind safety, and this is about our national program. And uh, you know, uh, I mean, it started, the first documented case of silicosis was in 1934 in India. And uh, if, you, if you really looked at it, the very first silicosis survey showed nearly 43% of the people working in Kolar gold fields had that. So that's, that's the kind of magnitude of this whole problem. And you know, if you really see over a period of time, of course, I mean, my presenters, uh, the panelists are have, going to have four presentations, one after the other. But the important issue here is most of these diseases are hardly treatable and there is a lot to do that is to do with prevention. And the prevention is the key that is there. The population at risk is also considerably high. I mean, I'm not, once again, I'm not going to go through this. And the sad part about it, and I'm going to talk, talk to Dr. Animesh, who is one of the preventive science specialists with us uh, and statistician also. The why so less reportage, you know, because there's a very, very small number of people getting reported. So I have a wonderful panel today with me and I'll just introduce to them in brief right now. And then I'll come back to you and introduce once their talks are over in a little more detail. But the whole idea is at this point in time, we need to do a lot for these people. And, and, the, and the issue is, uh, we seem to be, I mean, this is, this is one of those messages which, is, which are there, there on your screen. But while that message is on and you can read it, uh, I, we have Dr. Ayn Trigun from Gorakhpur who will start with his first talk followed by Dr. Ambika Sharma from SMS Jaipur, who will talk about silicosis. Then uh, the third talk is by Dr. Sukurva Chakravarti from Ranchi on CWP, if I'm not wrong. And then uh, we have Dr. Animesh Jain from Bangalore, who is going to talk about the prevention and the statistical part of it. To add certain spice to this whole, we, uh, whole mix, we have Dr. Mir Faisal from Srinagar, Kashmir. And uh, so that means we have, we are covering the entire country in a way. Um, and uh, of course, he will talk about the specific local issues and I'm going to ask questions about that. So um, I look forward to the talks first, listening to them. And uh, after the talks are over, I'll introduce each of these uh, speakers once again in detail. And uh, look at this entire business of silicosis, Coal workers, pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, and the various other plethora of other occupational related lung diseases in a different way at the end of this seminar. If, if we have started doing that, I think we have achieved our goal today. So, with that, over to uh, Dr. A. N. Trigun, and uh, his presentation will start. I'll stop sharing so that they are able to take over. Good evening. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Ian Tugul, consultant chest physician, and the topic allotted to me is pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis is a group of disorders which is caused by occupational uh, lung uh, disease. So, pneumoconiosis can be divided into fibrotic and non fibrotic. Among fibrotic pneumoconiosis, there are asbestosis, silicosis, Kohlbarkos pneumoconiosis, varidosis, and talcosis. <coughs> And non fibrotic uh, stidosis, <coughs> welder pneumoconiosis, stenosis, and baritosis. The concepts of occupational lung disease that it has uh, long latency, the gap in time between the onset of exposure and development of disease is dose response relationship, interaction among causes as cigarette smoke and air pollution, and inter individual variation. So, coming to my topic. Uh, that is asbestosis. Asbestosis is a fibrous material. It occurs naturally in many parts of the world. There are three main types. 
of asbestos they are chrysolite that is white asbestos amsoite brown asbestos and crocidolite blue asbestos other are anthophyllite and actinolites some points to note on asbestos is that more than 3000 people die each year of asbestos related disorder delay between exposure and onset of disease is approximately 15 to 16 years all types of asbestos can be dangerous if inhaled risks are increased by smoking the more asbestos fibers breathed in the greater the risk of to health there is no cure at present for asbestos related disease so fibers are 10 to 20 micromillimeter length and fibro are they are fibro and oncogenics asbestos body are rod shape 1 to 6 micrometer wide and 10 to 30 micrometer long they are yellow brown with pale center may be clubbed at one or both ends usually contains amphibole asbestos It is formed intracellular in macrophages iron is deposited 40% of fibers are transformed into asbestos bodies which are not fibrogenic or carcinogenic marker for markers of asbestos exposure not of disease asbestos bodies are found in lung parenchyma pleura sputum pleural effusion and other organs asbestos related lung diseases are some are non malignant pleural diseases pleural thickening pleural plaques benign exudative pleuritis round atelectasis and pseudo tumors second is pleural disease is marker of exposure usually no lung function is impaired pleural disease puts patient at risk for other asbestos related diseases 10% get interstitial fibrosis within a year and two times higher risk for further pleural disease asbestos asbestosis also involve parenchyma on cause interstitial fibrosis associated with more with crocidolite as smokers more prone to disease and x-ray chest so interstitial infiltrate so smokers are six times greater risk to die of asbestos The clinical presentation of asbestos is are shortness of breath, persistent dry cough, chest tightness, weight loss, late inspiratics, and up to 60% patient there may be clubbing. X-rays show so a small irregular opacity that developed in the lung parenchyma and obscure the normal bronchovascular branching pattern seen in the disease region. HRCT shows curvilinear subpleural lines, increase in trilobular septa, dependent opacities. parenchymal bands and interlobular core structure and honeycombing lung function tests show restrictive <laughs> changes decrease in diffusion arterial hypoxia hypoxemia and increase elastic recoil non specific immunologic findings are antinatural factors rarif says an elevation hlb 20 synthesis is question mark asbestos related lung diseases are bronchogenic carcinoma that are five time higher in incidence in non smoking asbestos worker 19 times higher in smoking exposed asbestos workers prevalent for adenocarcinoma chrysolite highest risk of bronchus carcinoma crocidolite highest risk for mesothelioma and other neoplasms are like larynx car- laryngeal carcinoma gi carcinoma breast carcinoma ovarian carcinoma and renal carcinoma diffuse malignant mesothelioma in 35 to 45 years after exposure more with crocidolite pleural plaques not a precursor four histology pattern are epithelial mesothelial mixed and undifferentiated presentation are chest pain prominent dyspnea clubbing and pleural effusion the x-ray chest may show effusion and situ uh, so pleural based lobular mass with chest wall and tip involvement This is the picture of posterior view of chest radiograph of a 75 year old male who worked in a shipyard during World War II in insulating ships. The radiograph shows bilateral calcified pleural plaques in face and on top of the diaphragm. The pleura is diffusely thickened, thickened bilaterally, and the costophrenic angle is blunted. Mediastinal pleural, uh, pleural calcification is present on the right. This is uh, so this. Uh, uh, X-ray chest view shows left-sided pleural effusion, bilateral pleural thickening, greater on the left than on the right, and a mass in the left mid-lung field. Large pleural effusion is on asbestos exposure worker with an underlying malignant mesothelium. This is the CT of H- uh, uh, asbestos related disorder. Treatment and prognosis. Coming to treatment and prognosis, major cause of morbidity and mortality in patient with asbestos inculcates the progression of. 
underlying lung disease and the development of lung cancer and malignant mesothelioma. There is accelerated decline in pulmonary function. At present, there is no established treatment for this disorder because of the risk of lung cancer and mesothelioma. However, medical surveillance is recommended. Another aspect is pulmonary rehabilitation, a program of exercise and ex education to help manage the symptom. Oxygen therapy, breathing in oxygen, this air form, a machine or a tank to help improve breathlessness if the blood oxygen level are low. Inhaler may ease the symptoms. Patient presenting with late stage previously undiagnosed asbestosis should be encouraged to apply for pneumoconiosis benefit. Treatment should be along routine lines for patients with respiratory failure with provision of domestic care. Oxygen for symptomatic relief of breathlessness, diuretic for right heart failure, and antibiotics for acute infection. Corticosteroid as far as recommended are of no value and should be avoided. In a patient of appropriate age and general health who doesn't smoke, transplantation would be an option. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Nitin Abhyankar, sir, for the nice introduction. Thank you very much, CCI, for giving me this opportunity to speak on pneumoconiosis. And I congratulate Dr. A. N. Trigun, sir, for his excellent talk on asbestosis. So I will be talking about the another pneumoconiosis, which was earlier considered as king of occupational diseases, which is silicosis. I'm going to start with the case. So a 38-year-old male presented to a busy pulmonary OPD with complaint of persistent progressive shortness of breath since nine months. He didn't complain any present or past illness. He was non-smoker, has no comorbidities. His vitals were normal and chest revealed bilateral vesicular breast sounds with no added sound. A chest x was advised to this patient because he has persistent progressive breathlessness and uh, he came to a pulmonary OPD for the same. So this was the X-ray. So what do you think one should do next? And what, did we miss something in this case? Yes, we did miss the occupational history. We, we went back to the patient to take the occupational history when he came with this X-ray. So on asking, what are you doing? He said he has a clean desk job since last two years. On further inquiry, he mentioned that he used to work in Jodhpur Redstone factory for about eight to nine years and used to make various sculptures and idols with the redstone. He also showed me a picture of his work on his mobile. So we saw that chest x ray was showing multiple nodules and they were predominantly spread equally in all over the lung. And when we did the PFT, we found a restrictive pattern and all other infective causes were ruled out in this case. A diagnosis of silicosis was made on clinical radiological basis for this patient. So coming to the disease, the disease is most common occupational lung disease and is caused by inhalation of respirable crystalline silica dust and is marked by inflammation and scarring in form of nodular lesions in lung parenchyma. So who are at high risk of getting this, this, this disease? The people who are working in mines, acquiring plate pencil industry, a gate industry, quartz grinding, foundry workers, and others. So before going to the pathophysiology of silica, we need to understand what is silicosis. We need to understand what is silica. So in the environment, silica is, is found in two forms. One is the crystalline form, also known as quartz, crystallite, cydamide. And another is the amorphous form, which is a non-crystalline or the powder form. The crystalline form are more fibrogenic and are causative for the silicosis. So after inhalation of crystalline silica, this silica interacts in there. There is a release of mediators by activated macrophages like interleukin-1, 18, TNF, free radicals, and fibrogenic cytokines. This all leads to the fibrosis of the lung. The disease is bro broadly classified in three major groups depending upon the uh, years of exposure of the 
uh, dust. First is the acute silicosis, which is also known as alveolar silicoproteinosis. This happens because of the intense exposure over a short period of time. And this is the only silicosis which even can present over the history of weeks or months and is quite fatal. The other form is the accelerated silicosis, which occurs because after 5 to 10 years of heavy exposure. And third one is the chronic silicosis, which is actually the most common silicosis. And patients come usually with the history of 10 or more years of exposure. And this is further classified as simple and complicated chronic silicosis. So most of these patients present with exertional dyspnea to start with. And, and in the later stage of, of the disease, they feel breathless even on the day-to-day -day activity. Cough with and without sputum can be present. Wheezing, chest tightness, and respiratory failure are the other presentation. So, uh, as I mentioned, that chronic silicosis is more common. So, chronic simple silicosis usually present as multiple nodular opacities, which are well defined and uniform in shape, ranging from one to ten mm in diameter. They are paralymphatic distribution. Uh, is present for this nodules, predominant in the upper and the posterior portion of the lungs, and hilar and mediastinal lymphadenopathy can be present, and with, with, which actually looks like axial calcification. The chronic complicated silicosis is also known as progressive massive fibrosis. Here, the opacities are a little larger, more than one centimeter in diameter, and irregular. They are in the mid zone on the periphery of the upper lung, migrating towards the hilar. So here are the X-ray of chronic simple, where the one to ten mm micro nodules are present all over the lungs bilaterally, and the other cases of chronic complicated silicosis, where we can see axial calcification, progressive massive fibrosis, and we can also notice a complication related to silicosis, which is the pneumothorax on the right side. So I mentioned the disease comes with lots of complications. The most important one is the silicotuberculosis. Patients with silicosis have higher risk of getting uh, tuberculosis or non-tuberculous mycobacterium infection. And this ranges from 5 to 40% increased risk. This is because silica damages the macrophages, which are responsible for fighting with the TB bacilli also. And uh, out of the three forms, the acute silicosis patients have, are at very high risk of developing tuberculosis than the chronic ones. Uh, continuing with the complication, this, it has been found that silicosis even triggers the immune response of the body. And there are many reports where uh, patients with silicosis were found to be having systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic renal disease, and systemic lupus erythematosis. Other complications, although they are the commoner one, uh, associated with silicosis are chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease because of the exposure to noxious stimuli. And if uh, silicosis is associated with smoking, then it is, is uh, uh, double harmful to them. They, they, they also complain with a spontaneous pneumothorax. Earlier, I guess, a few decades back, there were only one, two, or kind of uh, really scanty reports about pneumothorax in silicosis patients. And uh, now, from last few years, what the literature is showing, uh, the larger numbers of pneumothorax cases they are finding in silicosis patients. And now people are starting discussing about the incidence and prevalence of pneumothorax in patients with silicosis. So this, it, is, it has become a quite a common complication seen in patients with silicosis. Lung cancer, cord pulmonary, and respiratory failure are the another complications associated with the disease. So there's no specific treatment of the disease and supportive care is the only thing we, which we can offer to the patient. So one has to remove, reduce or manage complication of this disease and a patient is advised to avoid further exposure to silica containing dust. Personal protective equipment, that is primary prevention is, is, is better than uh, uh, nothing in these cases. And these all are the gears they should wear when they are the, uh, working at their workplace. So uh, with the popular phrase that prevents, prevention is better than cure, I want to end my talk. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. It was a very lovely talk. Thank you, Dr. Nitin, sir, for the lovely introduction. 
I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the whole CCI team for giving me the opportunity to talk upon the coal worker pneumoconiosis today. So it is a major type of pneumoconiosis. A uh, broad term is used nowadays as coal mine dust lung disease, where it is main part consists of silicosis, coal worker pneumoconiosis, and rest are mixed dust pneumoconiosis, dust related diffuse fibrosis and also coal dust related COPD. So by disease severity, coal worker pneumoconiosis are of simple and complicated type. Complicated coal worker pneumoconiosis consists the advanced stage progressive massive fibrosis. Looking at the pathogenesis, it all starts from the inhalation of the washed coal dust particles. Anthracite coals are more uh, known to be caused than the bituminous coal dust particles to cause the pneumoconiosis. These are the bipathogenesis, these are fibrotic type of pneumoconiosis. Initially, micronodules are formed, which are size of 1 to 5 mm, which are also known as coal macules. So these macules grow in size and also in number. When it becomes up to 5 to 10 mm, we call it coal nodule, and also seen with focal emphysema in the surrounding. In the advanced stage, these nodules coalesce and form the progressive massive fibrosis, with gross emphysema or the parenchymal distortion. According to the ILO or International Labor Organization classification, these are also divided into small opacity and large opacity. Small opacity up to 10 mm, which are also divided into rounded and irregular. You can see into this chart that rounded opacity is further divided into PQR according to the size of 1.5 mm, 1.5 to 3 mm and 3 to 10 mm. Also, the irregular opacities are uh, known as STU. Simple coal worker pneumoconiosis are mostly an incidental finding. Uh, we can see macules or micronodules through a mainly upper lobe and mid zone predominant. The posterior segment in upper lobe is the first place where this gets deposited. And the surrounding reticular fiber thickenings may or may not be present. Focal emphysema may or may not be present. These, in comparison to silicosis, are less well defined with more granular appearance. 10 to 20 percent of cases, central calcification is also seen. Hyalur lymph nodes are seen in approximately 30 percent of cases. In some cases, we also can see the perilymphatic diffuse distribution, including the uh, basal periphery and also the pleural surfaces in simple coal worker pneumoconiosis and the disease progression time is approximately four or five years. We can see into the slides simple coal worker pneumoconiosis may present as small ill-defined nodules. Sometimes they can be also found in the periphery and pleural as well. Coming to clinical features, these are sometimes incidental finding. Patient can be asymptomatic, occasional cough with thick sputum, or sometimes acute bronchitis type of symptoms can be present. Coming to complicated one. So when those macules or micronodules increase in the size and in number with irregular borders, they gradually progress from upper, middle to lower side and develop the traction bronchiectasis with surrounding emphysema. Because of the upper loop predominance, mostly found that the hilum are pulled up, loss of lung volumes are visible, and trachea can be also deviated to the same side. In the advanced stage, when the these large nodules coalesce, this coalescence and formation of the big fibrotic mass, this advanced stage is called the progressive massive fibrosis with a grave prognosis. So this is the complicated coal worker pneumoconiosis. We can see that the nodules have increased in both sides, in the basal zone as well, and also pleural vest, traction bronchiectasis and fibrosis also started in this stage. And this is the most advanced stage called progressive massive fibrosis, which can be the most common differential diagnosis comes as lung cancer. As we can see in this slide that the upper low predominant fibrotic masses are visible, though the surrounding emphysema, loss of lung volume, irregular uh, fibrotic bands give a diagnosis in more in favor of the PMF. Sometimes 
we can uh, found in few cases like one in one million cases there are associated rheumatoid arthritis in background of full worker pneumoconiosis sometimes found in silicosis patient also this is called kaplan syndrome and in that case this isolated kind of rheumatoid nodules can be possible to see in these cases when rheumatoid arthritis is associated it is the disease progresses faster sometimes the multiple nodules are also visible and in early stages pleural plaques can also be visible clinical features are normally it gives a long time to progress so very insidious onset let's say 15 to 20 years and chronic bronchitis like features will be always there associated with it that is chronic cough with thick purulent sputum thick dirty sputum classically called as mel melanoptosis with worsening gradually progressive breathlessness polyarthralgia present if there is associated rheumatoid arthritis secondary infections like tuberculosis even extra pulmonary tuberculosis are very common in this patient and in advanced stage we can see complications like chronic respiratory failure with gradual pulmonary arterial hypertension and cord pulmonary so the diagnostic challenges are here uh, when nodules started appearing in both the lobes simultaneously with the irregular margin the first thing comes into the mind is the lung cancer to differentiate with this but in this case ct and pet ct is not very helpful because the fdg uptake is high in both the cases lung cancer as well as cold worker pneumoconiosis so looking at to the disease progression when it is slow progressive calcification inside the nodules and uh, surrounding fibrosis always fa favor the pneumoconiosis but it is not very definitive. Sometimes MRI T2 weighted images can be helpful because it gives the high signal in can uh, case of lung cancer, whereas low signal density is seen in whole worker pneumoconiosis. So ultimately, sometimes the histopathological diagnosis are required where uh, lymph nodes are present and lung mass uh, is uh, suspected because uh, cold worker pneumoconiosis is a predisposing factor of lung cancer as well. PMF as well is a predisposing factor, so sometimes this is required. Recurrent PTB, recurrent extrapulmonary TB is also a very common problem. And if silicosis is involved, uh, sputum is often very much uh, is negative. So have to wait, send repeated sputum for cultures and other molecular diagnosis. If Kaplan syndrome is uh, suspected, immunological tests are required for rheumatoid factors and other associated tests. And eggshell calcification is very classical for the silicosis, but in some percentage of cases, it can be seen in cold worker pneumoconiosis as well. So the management are very common like all other pneumoconiosis to avoid further exposure. But even after stopping exposure, sometimes it's seen the disease gradually progresses to the complicated uh, pneumoconiosis. So if it is not possible to avoid the exposure, at least to send a employee to the patient to the least exposure area with the appropriate mask and gears and repeated follow-ups are necessary with chest x-ray sputum test and uh, pulmonary function test dlco if required supportive treatment like bronchodilator oxygen given infection to be treated time to time properly especially if tb is suspected pulmonary rehabilitation is having a great role for improvement of symptoms and as well as morbidity in this patient nutrition should be proper Vaccination, especially pneumococcal and yearly influenza vaccine, vaccination should be done on time. And uh, to treat the other complications, right, chronic respiratory failure and uh, chronic heart failure should be treated along with. Thank you. And uh, further, Dr. Animesh Jain will be presented, uh, present the preventive part of it. Yes, so I first want to thank uh, CCI for giving me this platform. And of course, thanks to Dr. Nitin and also the speakers before me, Dr. Dr. Trigun, as well as Dr. Ambika and Dr. Suprava. Uh, they've already taken you through the various aspects of pneumoconiosis. What I'll do is I'll just quickly sum up a few things and I'll talk about preventive aspects and a few scenarios in the, the situation currently, especially in India. Uh, so that's what I plan to do in a very short presentation. Now you must be wondering why am I showing you a picture of some ladies here in this presentation that to on pneumoconiosis. So uh, this is a very sad story. 
unfortunately all these ladies that you see here are from a village in orissa and in this odisha village what has happened is they were all widowed their husbands worked in mining and in this particular village almost all of them they lost husbands because of mining and very early on and they've been fighting for a legal battle to get some compensation similarly if you see another one in rajasthan where there are lots of mines and there also we've had this widow uh, young widows also so what i'm trying to show is that the problem is real there is a, a issue with particularly this particular uh, hemoconiosis and more so with silicosis as such now if you see on the left on your left in the on the screen you see a lot of times we see these kind of activities now there is a this is something like a drill which is happening in a dry uh, state so a lot of dust is produced and there is no protective equipment and on the right what you see is a times of india had run this that miners at risk and they talked about so many things so even lay press is talking about a lot of these things now so people are getting to know about these and what i'm showing you here is why do we need to worry now there are obviously mineral or inorganic dust which are there types of dust and these are things which have been done but if you see again on the right the pie chart shows you silicosis takes the largest share giant share here and then comes the others like you know coal workers pneumoconiosis other pneumoconiosis and asbestosis and other things so that's the the issue so silicosis is one of the most dreaded and it results if it's not prevented if it's not are uh, taken care of early so it can lead to death and this is what i was talking about so the odisha village ladies they fought for more than a decade and they were trying to get justice recently some time back they got some compensation awarded in 2017 uh though we are still to a certain whether that was finally translated to getting them the amount they were supposed to 46 lakhs for some 17 workers uh coming to this now you see what we talk about is the burden of mortality and the the disability adjusted life years now figure a that is on your left shows the mortality but you see the age range now this is a global distribution while it shows that there is a mortality which is higher in a high age group that is you know advanced or elderly age group what we have seen in india is the mortality is at a relatively younger or or say you can middle age age group that's the distribution which is different here now on the right again you see disability disability adjusted life years which is there again blue and red represent the gender that is male gender is blue and red is the women so again the distribution here is little different but here in india we see it at a younger and middle age group now this was one of the articles which had recently come up in 2022 uh, because a lot of these uh, effects are seen in mine workers in in rajasthan so this was a paper from aims jodhpur and among all the other things they said that it's a quite a neglected one uh, occupational lung disease and they talked about pulmonary rehabilitation all the more important for this group of people who are the majority of our viewers are from this particular you know pulmonary medicine so and they talked about certain things including a comprehensive approach they said we have to talk about combination and complication treatment we have to try the the life of the patient to be prolonged and how do we see to it that the progression of disease is delayed we don't want him to go into a rapid progression so even if the person gets affected so delay the progression we have to also try and relieve the pain by rehabilitating the person and of course needless to say the symptomatic treatment has to go hand in hand so these are the comprehensive things that we have to look at now there has also been a joint committee of the ILO and and the WHO which has looked into these things and they talked about certain things if you look at they said we have to make sure and ensure that the highest degree of physical mental and social well being of all the workers in any kind of occupation is provided and promoted we also have to prevent the departure from health in all the workers in any industry any kind of workforce and we have to protect them from any kind of risk which results from any kind of the factors they are exposed to during their work and lastly 
they have to be placed in certain environment which is conducive both physiologically and psychologically so that is something which is very paramount and that is what has been and i want to draw your attention to something which uh, sir thomas morrison lege has proposed he, these are known as lege's axioms if you look at it each of them is so meaningful they said he said unless and until the employer has done everything the workman can do next to nothing to protect himself although he is willing to do his part so that means the onus is on the employer secondly if you can bring an influence to bear external to the workman that is one over which he has no control that means you have to try and get something which the 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 worker will not be able to control and then you will be successful that means you have to do something which the worker without his own doing or something without his control or manipulation will be automatically exposed or not like you know uh, conducive to him so then you will be successful and practically all industrial lead poisoning is due to the inhalation of dust and fumes and if you stop their inhalation you stop the poisoning as simple as that and all workmen should be told something of the danger of the materials with which they come in contact and not be left to find it out for themselves because sometimes it may be at the cost of their lives so that is very very important and which has happened as i showed you some of this clips news clips as well so it is the duty of the employer to you know inform their employees and this is one of the important uh, diagrams which kind of sums up everything if you see there are different measures for prevention of these occupational hazards or occupational exposures first one it might be very easy to think about it that we protect them by giving them personal protective equipment but if you see at the same time for the effectiveness that bar on your left which shows least to most effective so ppe though it's very easy with sounds very you know fascinating and everything but it's the least effective then we can have administrative control so change the way the people work okay so we have to design some ways and change their ways the next thing could be we isolate them we have engineering measures we have, so we isolate them from the hazard they don't directly get exposed okay so the hazard is there but they are not or they we are reducing that so that the exposure is less and that the effects will be much more delayed or will be very minimal if that is not i mean if that can also be done or additionally if we want to we have being more effective measure it would be substitution so replace the hazard if we can get something else to substitute the substance which is hazardous that's the best and the most important one which may not be always possible is to totally eliminate the hazard physically eliminate that that means you remove and and that's it so these are some of the measures that can be done which is of course not possible in all the industries but these are some things and then other than that routinely we talk about medical measures engineering measures and legislative measures medical is important from this point of view and the audience here we should have a pre placement examination there are certain people who already have inherent tendency they may have you know immune deficiency they may have certain other respiratory diseases other other things maybe uh, they are undernourished so they can be you know accordingly placed then periodically examine them even after employment is done and then we have to provide them medical and healthcare services notify every case that happens supervise the working environment and maintains the records of their so that periodically we can even analyze and give them counseling and health education so that's important of course there are engineering measures which include many things but what i would suggest is trying to substitute enclose isolate or go for mechanization where you remove or you reduce the human contact even trying out ventilation using protective devices and in combination it's not that one one thing these can work and coming to the legislations there are a lot of legislations which are already there right from the you know 1940s that is factory act and then employee status insurance act and then of course we have also compensation the workmen's compensation act the mines act and other things now having said this there are other things which we have to look at so it is it is not just in isolation you have to talk about workplace health promotion in different aspects it starts with the diet the person takes a good nutritious diet 
you know, importance of physical activity to stay fit. Avoiding alcohol, drugs, and tobacco use. Having policies which promote and they are positively influencing the workers. Having screening and you know management of any illness that happens. And of course, stress is one of the most important contributors again. And of course, after COVID, we know that so stress management. Now there has been some positive light which has happened, which is happening. If you see 2016 in uh, Rajasthan, they started uh, actually looking into taking some steps and they made it notifiable. And going forward, 2019 itself, Rajasthan became the first state to actually give pension to people who have lung diseases. Of course, they have the huge number of mines. They have almost, you know, huge number of workers. So they started with uh, giving 4 lakh as one-time assistance for rehabilitation. If there was a death, the person whose legal or the death has happened, uh, that person's legal heir or nominee would get 1 lakh. And uh, there was also pension, which was thought of, which is either 4,000 per month or of the prescribed minimum wages, 50% of that given to the person. The family also gets a three and a half thousand rupees. There is also a one-time assistance of uh, education to the children, 25,000 per children for the maximum of two children. And in case the person passes away, funeral assistance of 10,000. So there is at least some benefit which has been given. But this comes only if there is a medical board certification or pneumoconiosis board has certified that there is a lung disease. So that's again important that they need to know. Because in one of the times that was found out that many of them thought that they died of TB. And then when the TB numbers were seen, the numbers were not enough. And one important aspect is research. If you see here on the right, India contributes to so num low numbers. Whereas China and US have the maximum number of research and research papers coming out. And again, articles are there, but even meeting abstract review articles and other things, but articles contribute quite a big chunk. And I think we need to start thinking of even documenting, reporting, and looking at various aspects of pneumoconiosis. So I think that's the way forward as well. These are some of the things in a nutshell we will discuss more as we open the panel. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we had a wonderful, wonderful presentations from all four, I mean, speakers. Animesh, I'm very much impressed by your presentation. So great job done. I mean, there is, there is something like an eye, eye opener. And I think it's going to, going to go a long way in you know us understanding it. And uh, let me reintroduce each of them in a little more detail. Uh, Dr. Trigun is a chess position. He is working as a DYD2 in Uttar Pradesh, Gorakhpur. And he was our first speaker who talked about asbestosis. And uh, the second one we had was Dr. Ambika Sharma. Uh, Ambika was from uh, or is from SMS Jaipur. And uh, I'll, I'll just see if I can share that slide uh, of ours. Let me just check that out. Yeah, so I think, is it visible? Just check because I'm sharing uh, in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Ambika is from, uh, it's an assistant professor in DTC in Vallabhai. Uh, uh, sorry, one sec. Yeah. Uh, she's assistant professor in Savai Mansingh Medical College, Jaipur, DTCD, Vallabhai Patel Chest Institute in New Delhi, DNB in Pulmonology, just, uh, working in Just Look Hospital and Research Center in Mumbai, and visiting fellow in University of Hospital in Southampton, NHS UK. And she, of course, has many national and international publications. Her talk was one of the most interesting that we had today. So... That is for Ambika. We have another faculty which is coming from the other end of the country, you must say. And uh, I'm sharing Dr. Mir Faisal here. Uh, he's from Kashmir and I'm going to ask him some questions related to 
uh, occupational lung disease and i don't know whether he has so much of that but we will ask what is happening in that that part of the world and that's important to us also so i'll just see um he's been to a completely a private practice kind of a thing and uh, uh, he's one of the top uh, private practitioners in srinagar that's what uh, i uh, am understanding and well so i think that is that that this is meer dr meer faisal for you and uh, and uh, this is dr animesh jain he is a professor of community medicine from kasturba medical college mangalore uh, mani that is unit of mh manipal and 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 well i mean he's been an honorary professor in, in indian medical association new delhi and i am told by uh, 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 my colleagues from the cci that he's one of the most enthusiastic supporters when it comes to some kind of statistical analysis in cci related work so animesh uh, welcome to this particular panel and the last but not the least i don't have or was uh, slide there but i have her introduction so i'll just check that out and so tell you uh so doctor sorry doctor sapurva chakravarti uh, she is a dnb in uh, pulmonology from and it works in bilai steel plant hospital she is also a european diploma um, of adult respiratory medicine she is a consultant and principal pulmonologist in raj hospital ranchi so i think that's that with that i'm going to stop sharing the screen and then we'll go with the questions and uh, dr trigun the first question to you because you talked about asbestosis trigun sir uh, do you think this is a dying disease or the disease of only old elderly or is it still there in various uh, forms still around so uh, your inputs on this is is it is it as it is going away or is it going to be still there and, and will we see it in future is it hidden some in many other occupations i uh, said as far as asbestosis is concerned uh, whatever the data shows uh, the use of asbestosis is in some countries getting down so when you can say uh, say Um, that in some countries it was extremely uh, uh, used in ship um, ship construction during World War II. Worldwide consumption of asbestos declined in 1992 to 50 percent at the peak of 1973, and in 1994, 2.4 billion tons were produced within U.S. Uh, country. So, uh, as far as concerned to the previous exposure, the chances of asbestos is going down. Uh, and uh, of course uh, it, it is an end disease because uh, as far as asbestos is concerned uh, it is uh, not so effective treatment is available here and prevention is the better cure uh, so many things are uh, being modified by uh, laws because uh, ex- ex- uh, being the curtailment of exposure by moist dusting and the tunneling of that uh, dust that can pro- that can prevent the uh cool man or you asbestos markers sir thank you thank you for your answer anivesh i am going to ask you a question i think every time we have one person i am going to ask you a question is asbestos banned today or still going to be a long time before we see a ban and if not i mean because there are so many good replacements for asbestos so why is it still there Very good question. Thank you. Though you caught me by surprise, but yeah, it's always welcome. Uh, first of all, thank you, CCI and Jitin sir and my two panelists having me here. And uh, sir, just to add, I am also a CCI member. Thanks to yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Anish Krishna. Yes, yes. Yeah, was one of the CCI members. Yeah, was from another stream. Another speciality. Yeah, it was one of the. In, I was the first one to be bestowed this honor. Yeah. So uh, coming to this, there are sixty-six countries which have already banned asbestos, sir. okay and uh, we haven't actually reached anywhere close as to my knowledge as of now but there are so many countries which have done that 
and i think as you rightly said we could do when we could think about it because uh, i think there are some occupations where we can actually think of uh, re- uh, substituting as well as now even some of the the uh, newer processes can be brought in and as i just touched upon in my presentation there are so many ways we can do so as of now it's not banned a simple answer is that uh, is the government thinking about it i have no clue but hopefully somebody would uh, think about it as of now silicosis seems to be something which is taking the the largest attention because there are a lot of deaths reported and there are certain parts like even rajasthan odisha some parts in the country where mining is done some parts of uh, uh, bihar jharkhand and all yeah, so that, there like, the you know, whole yeah. government uh, presentation on silicosis you know because yes, uh, yes. Yeah. but the focus seems to be on that and as we saw yes. it seems to Absolutely. be just forgotten but yes, i think absolutely. in fact if 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 i remember it rightly one of our very close colleagues dr nifarkar was last mesothelioma and uh, from mumbai and and, and mesothelioma as we know is the commonest causes as this process so he, yes. even he as in his younger age somewhere got ex- got exposed oh. and uh, and uh, i mean uh, he remember it very, very fondly but then i mean a doctor getting mesothelioma is sad i mean super sad isn't it and yes absolutely and dying dying because of it so i think really sorry to hear that yeah so that, that 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 that's that's the sorry state of affairs but at the same time i think things are changing and i think i am now going to jump from you directly to kashmir to dr meer faisal uh, sirji uh, welcome to this particular seminar and I, i i know we are you're not making a presentation here directly but first question i'll ask you is, is pneumoconiosis is all that common in kashmir and is it if it is there why if it is not there why both of you Uh, no thank you nidhi sir thank you for the question i think um, uh, pneumoconiosis we do see some uh, pneumoconiosis but actually in kashmir we don't have that much of uh, industries we don't have mining industries we don't have uh, um, uh, those industries that we, like uh, coal industries so we don't see that much of pneumoconiosis we do have some of the uh, some uh, cement industries here and uh, there's there's a bit of uh, issue but not not much because not many people are employed in those uh, in those industries so uh, as of now i don't think we have too much of the load here uh, we do see some ikaduka patients somewhere but uh, not much yeah i, I we have I, we have some patients because people from india do come here and then they work here and then we see those patients we do see those patients who are from laborers who come from india and then they work here we do see those patients who are who are here and then then when they come to our uh, opds and then we see these those patients but as of uh, as of uh, if you say the patients who are originally here we don't see much of patients here okay that's 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 interesting so i mean if you really see exposure related diseases what is the commonest that you see seen uh, in, in kashmir uh, uh i'm not saying occupational exposure but exposure may be even at home so is kangri kangri the most common thing kangri related uh, kangri related yeah we do have indoor indoor air pollution is is a is a uh, cause of concern here yes. we have winters here and we have close environment and we do see we do see carbon monoxide deaths here we have we see lot of carbon monoxide deaths here you must have seen in the uh, press also we have in winters we have families dying three four five members of families dying because of carbon monoxide we do have those those kinds of issues here because of the close environment in during winters we we i i remember last year we had a couple who had come for uh, for honeymoon here and they in in winters they stayed in a hotel and they had some they had that gas heater burning and then they died because of asphyxiation of it was a honeymoon couple was it so we uh, we do see that that kind of uh, issues we uh, but ha um, kangdi related issues then we have that bukhari related issues then we have now now nowadays we have that gas heaters they those those heaters those burn the oxygen and then they release carbon dioxide we do have that those issues in uh, previous uh, in in in, in uh, rural areas 
we had uh, people who were living in close and then they used to burn some uh, wood there so that they get warm so they had some uh, little bit uh, issues with that uh, with um, smoke and all that so in in urban areas also we are seeing uh, issues of carbon monoxide poisoning not as a pneumoconiosis but yeah. these are these are the issues that we are these facing are so i think you know i think it's not entirely occupational but in in no, your it's not entirely occupational yeah. in, in your sense in in you know kashmir everybody wants to go to kashmir and for everybody who is working in kashmir possibly that's an occupation so yeah. some people are at an occupational hazard isn't it yeah uh, i mean i would love to be in srinagar next week if you invite me so yeah I mean, please yeah. sir please sir please sir <laughs> uh superva uh, i am going to come to you superva now and uh, the uh, wonderful talk that was on cwp that was coal workers uh, pneumoconiosis and uh, what do you think are which are the hot spots because uh, if, if you are you are in ranchi and near bilai steel plant or if i am not wrong i mean i i didn't get that right to if correct me please if i didn't do that so what uh, what is your take on are there a particular areas which are very common in india and that's that's number one and the second question i have immediately after that is is this this is steadied declining plateaued or is on the rise thank you sir thank you for the question uh, sir i did my dnb primary dnb from vilai steel plant hospital Yeah, that yeah, is located yeah. in so Chhattisgarh. Yeah, yeah. So now I have worked. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah I have worked in Dhanbad, and now I am in Rachi. Yeah. So, uh, sir, actually, these are coal mines areas, and uh, this Chhota Nagpur plateau and uh, Damodar Valley. This whole area, including Jharkhand, the western part of West Bengal, some parts of Odisha, some part of uh, Chhattisgarh. some part of uh, madhya pradesh this uh, belt actually consists of the large chunk of coal reserve in india uh, like in jharkhand which is having the largest reserve of coal we have uh, in surrounding areas dhanbad bokaro and uh, godda and western west bengal raniganj asansol these areas in chatisgarh there are korba and raigarh area in mp singrauli so these are the major coal mine areas and surrounding there are uh, you know steel plant like bokaro steel plant durgapur vilai steel plant rorkela steel plant so these are the main hot spot of pneumoconiosis and also the uh, coal fired thermal plants are also here yeah and uh, associated in jharkhand in surrounding area like uh, uh, hazari bag there are maika and bauxite mines are also there so all these makes a large hot spot of uh, pneumoconiosis especially coal worker pneumoconiosis and silicosis yeah. and uh, as uh, in the beginning you said if we go for the official data reporting is very very less and uh, any doctor working in this coal uh, hospitals they will say they have not seen or seen very rarely a case in last 10 to 12 years but if we work as a physician even a physician in this area we can see all those presentations of bizarre x rays progressive breathlessness over diagnosed tb repeated uh, uh, att being taken or all the complicated cases especially in the aged population so especially uh, it has declined or it is a plateau it's a very controversial to say and it's a gray area sir do uh, there are so many increasing would you say that they are say that it, it's decreasing definitely they okay. say this is yeah, because i think i think yeah because the government data says so and yes, sir, and i think it does seem to be reflecting in our observations also yes yes sir uh, Yes. So I, that brings me to the most interesting question of uh, which comes to uh, the n- next speaker that is Dr. Ambika Sharma, and uh, she made a statement that silicosis is the new asbestosis. So is that how do you validate that que- that statement, uh, Ambika? Number one, second, how do you establish a diagnosis of it, and then you know. how how do you go about the diagnostic algorithm for silicosis so ambika i want to you yeah so thank you very much sir uh, there are three questions actually yeah so i'll take the first one 
So this was the uh, you know uh, recently very much in media uh, about the silicosis and the new asbestos. As we know, the silicosis is an ancient disease. You know, it's from the Egyptian era or the construction works were there at that time also. And silica is the main crust of the earth. You know, there everywhere it's earth and silica is the part of it. So uh, over the years, that was found that silicosis incidence and prevalence was decreasing in the countries. But in between, there was surge of uh, uh, of silicosis cases in few of the countries: USA, Spain, uh, Belgium, Italy, and Germany also. So they, these people then found that there was a special engineered uh, stone has come into the market, which we are also using in our country. If you if you see the modular kitchens and you know a dining tables and the bathroom countertops, so this was a special stone uh, which lead to the accelerated number of silicosis cases and then that time they were everyone was worried is this the new new uh, like silicosis again is searching and and these patients were have were developing uh, silicosis very quickly and and was quite in the severe form and many of them had the acute silicosis also so at that particular moment that that was a discussion which was very highlighted is it the new asbestosis because in asbestos we have always con uh, considered it more more lethal than the silica in our literature. So that that came from there, sir. But I'm not sure this is the new asbestosis or silicosis itself from very beginning is 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 known for fibrogenic properties and its own uh, consequences. And coming to the diagnosis of uh, of silicosis, so uh, as I mentioned that. Uh, it one need to have an occupational history. So history is very important. So you read the literature and even the ILO, uh, ILO guidelines world over. Like it's not in India that we have in the resource limited setting or something like that. All over the world, they say go for the clinical history, see the radiology if it is matching with the with the silicosis presentation, and exclude all other causes. If this three fits very well, then diagnosis is established of a silicosis. But if there is, you know, you're not sure about a very clear cut history of occupation, the radiology is also not very classical, then one can go for the further investigation, like doing a bronchoscopy or bronchoscopic biopsies, but it is not absolutely required to see the silica particles and the pathological these things. Yeah, so these the, the, what was the third question, sir? I just <laughs> forgot the which one was the third question. Oh, so I think the same diagnostic algorithm. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So these are three things, yeah. So uh yeah, uh, very standard uh, radiological. How, how often do you request say, a neighbor's to be in a? Uh, because you know that the disease looks around the hay, and sometimes you have uh, lymph nodes which are around the mediastinum. So uh, I, I don't think you you don't need that, isn't it? I mean, it's the lung function and the classical history and the classical radiological appearance, which is good enough for most of the cases. Uh, once in a while, of course, I mean, you will you will probably need to rule out other issues. And uh, I, I think I think I'll I'll just continue with you and ask that question of silico tuberculosis. Is it a genuine association that we are seeing, or is it just because we have so much tuberculosis in India? Half the population is in any case having latent tuberculosis in their body. So, is that the story? Uh, uh, so, so there is a genuine uh, relationship between silicosis and tuberculosis. As as I was mentioning in my slides, that silica particles mainly uh, attack on the macrophages of the alveoli. So, macrophages again, we remember the pathophysiology of tuberculosis. So, the first step to kill the TB bacilli is macrophages. So silica particles quantitatively and qualitatively damages the macrophages. So uh, when the TB bacilli, when especially in the epidemic yeah. endemic country like us, they, the patients of silicosis, when they come in contact with this uh, TB bacilli, they are not able to fight it well and they are more prone to get tuberculosis. And the incidence is well established, like they are at higher risk of up to four, 5 to 40 percent than the general population to get silicosis. Yeah. So okay. there's another theory about the iron theory. If you, uh, yeah. if you want yeah. me to brief, I can say yeah. that. But I don't know. Cool. But 
sure. much people support on that part also that that silica has the tendency of absorbing iron and the mycobacterium he uh, they also likes to grow in the iron rich environment yeah. Yeah. so that so, is the, another story which has been considered that to why to go hand in hand when there is a silicosis there is a silico tuberculosis yeah. also in that patient but one one way or the other if it is not cause effect but it is at least a strong association and we are not 100% sure as to what that would be uh dr animesh i'm going to jump to you back again because i think every after every of these questions is there some kind of a compensation mechanism for silicosis in existence uh sir as i understand there is in fact uh, uh the as i presented the rajasthan government has actually uh, done that already some time back they had 1 lakh rupees which was increased to 2 lakh rupees and now they give 4 lakh rupees as i said yeah. now uh, that is there i, I think other, what, I, what i really don't like uh, is funeral assistance i mean i that, do i do that, understand that is that is really pitiful i mean i i don't i don't think i'll ever take that as a as a right measure for anything in the world i mean if if you are needing that then then they are doing something really wrong particularly sure. when we are talking of an occupational lung disease please sorry sure. continue sorry i no 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 absolutely i agree but but having said that they started with silicosis but now they have expanded recently in 2019 what they've done is they have made it as a pneumoconiosis so earlier it was particularly silicosis because they were seeing a lot of silicosis and silicosis deaths sure. and as i said in fact at one one time lot of these uh, the family members and all somehow they had this uh, kind of impression that they had tuberculosis or some respiratory disease but when they checked the numbers and you know didn't match and and then uh, finally they found out that they were working in mines and putting two and two together and they also their reports so it was found that they were actually silicosis victims and then the one of the ngos took up this cause and they said that you know these people need to be aware second thing is if they are not certified to have passed away due to silicosis or they have been a victim of silicosis or maybe they've had a real considerable morbidity because of that then they don't get any benefit so Absolutely. that's why they said that that they need to be certified and that's where they took up this cause and uh, there's one mr particularly mr rana who i read about and i was quite impressed so so he said that no we have to do this and then they started doing this similarly the case uh, study of odisha and you know some others i have seen so it it was like people did not have much clue and there is also a, a video actually because of paucity of time i didn't share in fact i thank one of our, our post graduates just you know i appeared for exam dr nene feren who helped me with some of the material and even putting together the slides of course i did some research but she also helped so cheek shared a video in that the women folks whose husbands have passed away and their even children have gone back to these mines you know why because they don't have enough to support themselves i mean what a pathetic state of affairs so yeah. i know i'm digressing but you know there is a, there is mechanism but the problem is there are a lot of red tapeism there are a lot of things in between so we need to make things easier like we say that you know ease of doing business so these are the things see if we cannot do that these people will forever try to get that justice or maybe try to get that compensation absolutely so even yeah. though it's 4 lakhs and other things which i showed but it's not as easy so we need to also look at somehow make these things easier so that they know what are their rights exactly exactly i think uh, from the preventive and the compensatory point of view i'm going to jump now back to Dr. Trigun and Trigun sir, uh, you talked about asbestosis. So, uh, have you come across a benign asbestos-related pleural effusion? Because I think all of us have come across mesotheliomas and mesothelioma-related effusions. Uh, if Dr. Dr. Trigun, are you there? Uh, I don't think he's there, isn't it? I mean, anyone of us come across benign asbestos-related pleural effusion? While he joins, I, I'll I'll try and share a case because. i have a person who owns a sandblasting company literally literally owns it and he started it and he has been doing it for last 35 years in pune and the nearby areas and i came across a situation where he is ha- having a undiagnosed pleural effusion i landed up doing a thoracoscopy for him we did a biopsy biopsy is absolutely benign and 
after all the search in the third or fourth sample that we sent there was one gene expert which was positive so we were not sure whether the whole story is matching or not anyway we gave him att and we are on att but but this was according to me a benign asbestos related or obg- even silica related the pluralifusions are known though, though, though they are rarer than say bap the bap as compared to that so uh, i don't think dr trigun is uh, yes i am here sir Oh, oh, you are there, sir. Sir, please, please. Uh, so you are actually, sir, uh, BAPA is not so much common, yeah. and I think in most of the cases, it is got uh, get undiagnosed. Yeah. As uh, our country is tuberculosis endemic, so most of the people uh, try to treat it all effusion as a tubercular effusion. Exactly. Uh, but uh, I differ from here because all effusion are not tubercular. So uh, in BAPA. Uh, what uh, uh, i will uh, try to do is uh, first of all photosynthesis is must yes uh, even even if the patient that, having that, mild to moderate synthesis and uh, send it the first cytobiochemical investigation right. if investigation come what were we found it is a positivity of cells they are mesothelial linings and the parietopla is uniformly involved with minimal thickening of mesothelia Pleural plaques due to asbestos exposure are usually bilateral in 80% of cases, whereas unilateral pleural plaques are uh, may be due to uh, um, uh, trauma or old cause or due to collagen vascular disease. Sir, I am a little bit poor to recollect, so I have written my data on my diary that, that I am sharing to you. So yeah. treatment is non-asbestos pleural plaques since they are marker of asbestos exposure, so that can uh, in future lead to asbestosis. in diffuse pleural thickening uh, mostly basilar pleura are, uh, are in bad cp angle are not are involved not treatment except in uh, strict monitoring of the patient is mandatory if it, if there is a clear cut case of bap uh, so we will try to uh, do a biochemical examination which will show uh, exudate uh, with normal glucose concentration mesothelial cells Found in fifty percent of cases, in twenty five percent of patient, the fluid is eosinophilic also. Rarely, asbestosis produces uh, products are uh, uh, re- 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 referred as a benign due to lack of evidence of malignancy. So we refer as a benign. Yeah. Collectively, may persist for collection may persist for six months. It automatically goes. on and uh, it may appear after uh, in the contralateral side so uh, okay. so we have to uh, look after and we have to keep under observation uh, but that's all uh, uh, there is no definite other treatment exactly and i'll just continue with you for an, another second and say i mean another minute and say uh, when do you think this given effusion is meso rather than a benign and so when would you do a biopsy is there a clinical or radiological clue or i think sir a thoracoscopy may rule out this uh, uh, cause yeah. Uh, biopsy of visceral pleura and pleura uh, may, may may have some clue to so so what what do you resort to normally a ct guided biopsy uh, of a say a nodule or a, a thoracoscopic biopsy or so i mean thoracoscopic biopsy thoracoscopic thoracoscopic biopsy that, that's that's that gives you a conclusive diagnosis mostly yes, yes. sometimes i mean, I, mean I, i am a thoracoscopist and i know sometimes it is so difficult because of fibrous mesothelium may... it is so difficult to really you know get get it enough pleura and get into the deeper layers and actually document uh, do- document that the malignant dip- part of it so i think some once in a while it does become very difficult to diagnose that even even with thoracoscopy but yes. i will I'll, i'll definitely so my exposure is very less that's yeah. right uh, combination of these two is possibly the best uh, if you if you have a nodule and you can get a ct guided biopsy it's not a bad idea but i think thoracoscopic biopsy definitely becomes better no question on that uh i think i'll move on from this to back to uh silicosis and uh, i mean it's, uh, ambika is back to you uh they talk about you know s- allowable limits of silica dust so i mean do you can you can you ex- elaborate or illuminate us on this i mean and and and, and what kind of protective 
PPEs are, you know, what kind of measures or how, how is it working out in our scenario, very frankly? So, uh, so uh, there is a society which is called as OSHA, this is Occupational Safety and Health Administrative so- Society, which, which makes the guideline for the occupation related things. And they have made the guideline for permissible uh, exposure limits for the silica dust. And they say that should not be more than 50 micrograms per yeah. cubic meter in yeah. eight hour duty schedule. So uh-huh. an employer should make sure that their employee should not be exposed to more than this concentration of the silica. So this is about the, uh, um, the exposure limit, what they have said. Now, what can be done to keep this dust in this limit and decrease the exposure uh, of uh, workers from the silica? So these are two different questions. So um, like they, they like, uh, the techniques are different to protect them. So, you know, decreasing the exposure level at the workplace can be done by using a nice exhaust, the open places, uh, using hydroblasting, wherever the work is going on, uh, putting water instead of the, uh, what uh, Dr. Animesh showed the pictures, you know, most of the places it is dry, silica is getting cut, grinded, polished, and there are lots of mm-hmm. aerosols with that. Yeah. So using water at all these places will help to these patients. So, uh, I, I, I recently had the front of my house, there was a road which had to be excavated for a drainage line to go in. And they did it, you know, in the heat of the summer and the way they were blasting it. Uh, I mean, I mean, don't you think that they would be exposed to one way or the other, even if we were not exposed to, we probably were exposed to, but then a person working there in a dry situation and no hydroblasting, that's a problem, isn't it? So yes. shouldn't, shouldn't that hydroblasting at least be the new norm? It should be. I think it's already there in this, you know, the guidelines made by the occupational societies and the safety societies. So they definitely mention wherever they can put nice exhaust, HEPA filters, powerful filters, open spaces. They have, you know, uh, even the dust, if you see one of the pictures, they were showing the dust goes in one direction when you cut it. So that dust should go in a, a, a kind of cause or a extractor of the dust. So that all things are there in the place. I don't know how much they are utilized or not, but they all can be used by the uh, employer at the place. And for the employee, it, like they should wear the PPE and the respirators. Respirators will be more helpful to them for, for stopping to inhale this thing. N95 respirator, they call it more powerful ones. Uh, so they can stop the uh, the size of uh, silica particles which we they are inhaling in the good amount. Along yeah. with that, there are many other protocols of you know cleaning clothes, not eating foods in that environment, and uh, many more things. I think Dr. Animesh has mentioned in his slide about all yeah. these things. I'm going to go to Animesh next yes. because I think I have a question related to this N95 <laughs> that you talked about. So so think of it, uh, Animesh. I, this is this is going to you. Sorry, 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 sir, Superwa, please. The same question. Uh, in extension, I would like to add some information please, about please. the cold work and pneumoconiosis. Even the USA Mine Safety and Health Administration, in 1972, they said the permissible will be 2 mg per meter cube, which yes. came down in 2014 as 1.5 mg per meter cube. But yeah. they are providing the continuous personal dust monitoring or continuous ambient air quality monitoring device yeah. under which the uh, supposed to work. Otherwise, there was no other way to yeah. measure it. Yeah. So how much is the exposure is? Sir. It's the same thing uh, as. Can, uh, I, can I ask you another question in the same way? That what is coal mining and coal milling? That's number one. And the second is, if you are deep down there, is it different? And is it different uh, when you're up, up on the ground so the so, scenarios the surface mining is just encouraged uh, more because it caused the laser exposure 70 yeah. percent surface mining being done nowadays so that you know underground mining can be done minimized way minimized, and uh, yeah. so that you know with the coal the coal rock and other beam should not be burst in such ways there are some other policies as well so which layer they are going because when there are mixed dust along with the wash, uh, there is uh, then the possibility of aggravation of disease is more. So that is why there are some new policies like which uh, areas should be busted underground. 
So and lot I of think, things are there. Coal, coal gets mixed with silica, and higher the yes, silica, yes, yes. then there is silica, more quartz, of, silicates, a uh, lot of other mixed uh, things are there. And when it gets uh, gets more, more and more the density, and the, this is how it progresses. Somebody has asked us, and I think I'm going to continue with this as well as to you, and then to Ganimesh. uh can you ask about chemo prophylaxis can these people be on some drug some medicine which can help so routinely nothing is given but uh, when tuberculosis is suspected normally in i have seen in the steel plant they all carry the old x rays the yeah. you know the follow up x rays so the new one with the new symptoms they are matched the, if the new opacity has come and this is how it's being you know uh, empirically the itt being started and when the confirm culture or sputum reports come then the contract been traced to give the chemo prophylaxis which is nowadays 300 mg per day inh can be given for 6 months so for the fampicillin inh yeah so that's, that's, that's only for, that's for, that's for the other, other than yes uh, other, other than, than that, that in general is there some some kind of drug magical drug for example um nsdl cysteine or you know did you have you have you come across anything like that i haven't so i i i haven't sir. it's only all supportive a, a, anybody from you know dr mayer uh, anybody else has come across any other drug which can sort of be given to these people and sort of protect their lungs from getting uh, this disease or these diseases not even just one disease because there's a plethora of them they're very frank uh, animesh i'm going to come to you about the uh the 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 i i, I think uh, what we were we were on uh, chemo prophylaxis 95 n95 we N95, were saying N95. yes 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 so uh, the kind of environment and the health situation and the health awareness and the kind of climatic conditions that we have we doctors found it so difficult to wear n95 even during a very horrible covid pandemic where the death of uh, death was almost like you know next uh, three days away and we are talking of say a coal worker <laughs> or a person exposed to say uh, silica to wear it for years all together at workplace for eight hours at a time is it real is it realistic when he has lunch what does he do when he has you know i mean we 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 uh, it, during the covid times Oh, the simplest measure was we placed the dining table in a different way, in such a way that they were not placing each other, so that the that the you know because in in the in the health workers situation, the seven or eight people had to eat together. There was no no other way. So we placed them not facing each other. I mean, crazy arrangements we did during those periods. But does it is the is the is it realistic to do? expect our people to wear mask and if not i mean the next question is how do i make uh, these people aware and what 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 is the role of everybody i mean right from government to ngos to what not where how and and even doctors how can we play a role? so a lot of questions to you <laughs> yes yeah, so wonderful questions actually and actually you have uh, like taken the crux of the matter very rightly said the health workers have have really experienced it during the covid times so it's very difficult and again imagine the conditions that they have to work in so it's very difficult absolutely and that is why if i can again remember, remind you of the the slide that i had presented with the you know the inverted pyramid now if you see that's why the ppe i and i think i said that also if the i remember right yes, yes yes so i said you know it's it's very easy it's fascinating but then it's not practicable and yeah. it's it's got the least effectiveness right so that's why it's not and yeah. that is why we have to look at the alternatives which were presented now after 3 years my mask which was like tight there is mostly down there <laughs> when i went to the to, to be honest actually yes see especially in the first uh, peak of the wave and and the first lockdown we were very very religiously wearing it but yeah. to be honest just about About a, a month or two back, when I was trying to wear even a, a surgical mask yeah. during summer here, because summer was really bad and humid here in Mangalore, so it, I was finding difficult. And I was like, "How did I wear it during that time?" I was wearing N95. I really thought about it. So, so yes, you're right. It's absolutely correct. Having said that, see, we have to look at other measures. One is 
we have to try and you know have a mix of measures we, where we can probably try and do some engineering measures try uh, you know eliminating if possible if not substitute and also looking at at some of the administrative ways where or we can even give rest some kind of you know shifts things like that so those kind of things can be looked at and it has to be a mix of measures the other very important thing which is often overlooked is having periodic examinations because I we don't do always that's and it. this is something very very important. important and in this context in fact recently there has been a gazette which has been uh, done i mean there is there is a, a new uh, this one occupational safety health and working condition code 2020 in fact it's supposed to have uh, all the measures of the all the other acts like you know the factories act finers act esi and all that they they've all been subsumed into this you know and and a lot of provisions and some of the things they have lowered in fact where there was a requirement of i mean i don't remember all the things but something like where it was 500 they made it 250 only workers and then some of them where it was uh, 250 or uh, 500 they made it requirement of only 100 workers being there you have to do this so those kind of things so again that's a very positive step but you know again we are very good at at bringing re regulations and laws but when it comes to implementation we lack yeah. so i think that's where i would like to say that you know we have to make sure that we we look into it that we uh, implement it and your question about ngo they have a role ngos have a role one i quoted the example of rajasthan in fact there are ngos like rotary and lions working in different areas including you know blindness and even tb control and polio of course we've seen rotary's uh, championship uh, kind of project but Having said that, I think this is another area where they have a, a role to play because they can help in advocacy. They can also help in actually trying to, to see to it that some of these provisions can be uh, made realistic. They, they have the, the uh, like some large NGOs have presence in, you know, across the state. So, so that is another area where that has to be done. And when it comes to awareness, I think the worker has to be aware. It is the, the responsibility of the employers as well as uh, the the people around them to make them aware and also the role of of the government and the uh, the employees themselves because everybody and i think i mean i just take a clue from i think uh, one of the presenters i don't remember was it suprava or, or uh, uh, i think dr ambika said you know i think uh, it's about even seeing to it that it is reported and it is diagnosed correctly because yes. that's very important if they come to the health facility and they've not diagnosed or there is a delay in diagnosis, that yeah. can be catastrophic. Absolutely. So I think there is a there is a you know mix of things that we have to think Absolutely. about. I, 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 this point is very well taken. In fact, I'll just quote, a, uh, I mean, before I go to the next question to Meer, sir, uh, I quote a story where we had a high density polyethylene expo exposure. I mean, he was working with HDP. And that person was exposed to 10 years of it. It's 10 years is not a big time. But at the same time, this man had landed up with a lung fibrosis. And we had to actually do a thoracoscopic lung biopsy to document that there was an unexplained fibrosis. He was not exposed to anything else and only HDP. And then sort of he had to, you know, he somehow managed to get some compensation out of it. So I think it's critical that the doctors establish the diagnosis and write it clearly. Uh, uh, that yes, this is possibly occupation related. So right. thank you, sir. So, one more thing, just wanted to announce: there are almost thousand logins, nine ninety yeah, plus yeah, yeah, logins yeah. live. So I I, I, I was thinking we were the only going. We are going to be the only people. No so, no no. no login for pneumoconiosis. <laughs> that's brilliant. Absolutely, and that's I think hats off to CCI and Krishna sir for yes. doing that stupendous job I mean, I mean crazy isn't it thousand Absolutely. people listening on to this kind of uh, so kudos to all of us kudos to all of us uh, i think we are doing something good now, dr mir uh, uh, yeah, of course we are not talking of pneumoconiosis when it comes to you but we are talking of the kangri related or the indoor air pollution related exposures and how do you treat them i mean what is your strategy is uh, does does your um, uh, treatment change uh, or is it like same like a conventional COPD where you will get a lama and lava in place in first and add ICS later or do you add ICS earlier? Uh, is there any difference? 
No, I think we don't make any difference. We treat them as uh, simple COPD patients, but we uh, try to avoid the uh, triggers. Uh, otherwise, uh, we treat them as uh, normal COPD with bronchodilators and with uh, LABA and I ICS. We uh, treat them as uh, simple COPD patients. Uh, yes, we we try we try to tell them to um, uh, remove those hazards what, what they are and how and uh, so so that so that the, uh, in winters we see a we see a surge of uh, symptoms as exacerbations in winters. So we try we try to educate the uh, patients that this these things have to be done in winters and you have to take fresh air and all that. But that is that being uh, 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 as far as your question is concerned regarding the treatment. Treatment remains same. It remains yeah, same, as, the same. The as, same opted, as opted. Normal yeah. and whenever needed ICS and yeah, whenever needed ICS. So it's not different. No, because no, it's not. Different. What I see in my area is most of it is not so much so of. Uh, of course, I mean we are talking of two totally di different geographies, but we see much more responsiveness to steroid, and it is more like a. Uh, COPD A, which is you know asthma, which has not been treated for a long time, and here I think what you are exposed to is possibly a more like a noxious particle related COPD, which behaves like a COPD. So lama laba becomes the first, and I yeah, lama lama laba becomes the first choice. So that's that st that strategy remains more or less the same like any other noxious particle, including cigarette smoke. So I think yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, that's where we are. Uh, Trigun sir, I'm coming back to you with a very different uh, uh, question. Nothing to do with all this, uh, nothing to do pre with prevention. But one thing is, uh, has management focus on mesothelioma, uh, malignant mesothelioma shifted from radical surgery? We were talking of, you know, um, extra and this and lymph node removal and whatnot to a reasonably effective chemotherapy of late. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is being done. It is under trial. Uh, chemotherapy with doxorubicin or adromacin has some variable response without prolonging survival. Yeah. Intervention yeah. such as gene therapy or use of cytokine for the treatment of malignant, malignant mesothelioma are currently being investigated. One thing more, I will add to a recombinant interleukin 2. Uh -huh. It's gene therapy followed by adding anti-viral uh, uh, drug uh, gensaclovir uh, oh. is being helpful in uh, treating malignant mesothelioma. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, great. So, um, very, very... So, so, we can say that we are switching from re radiation therapy to chemotherapy. So, I think less people are getting exposed to surgery related to malignant mesothelioma at least. I think yes, that's yes, yes, yes. Story. Okay. Yeah. So I think we are now more or less done with my questions and now we move on to audience, the audience questions. So next 10 minutes or so, I think, and then we'll wind up. So Shubham Sharma from Delhi asks you all role of lung transplantation in fibrotic pneumoconiosis. Are these good candidates, bad candidates, horrible candidates? Where do you place them in general? Principally, you may or may not have exposure. Strigun sir, we can lung transplant and everybody can come in. Sir, lung transplant can be a good option, but there must be certain criteria, patient is comorbidity and time for arranging lung is must. Absolutely. And of course, lung transplant is to be think of, but certain criteria to be fulfilled. Patient should be young and free from yes. other morbidity, yes. and there should be time to arrange lung transplants. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and any other thoughts? Yes, uh, yeah. you are raising yeah. hand. I, I want to add, uh, Nidhi sir, I want to yeah, add. Maybe, yeah, we sir, sir, uh, as we see nowadays, we have seen a lot of lung transplants happening. Uh, we have seen post-COVID, pre-COVID, we have seen a lot of lung in India also, we have seen a lot of lung transplants. Yeah. But I don't find any 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 uh, published case of pneumoconiosis for lung transplant. We have not seen yet uh, yes. pneumoconiosis, uh, published case of pneumoconiosis. Yes. We do have lung transplants happening uh, in and out. But uh, I don't think we have a published case as of yet. Ambika, uh, your silicosis. Your... So while going through the literature for the silicosis, I found that they support the lung transplantation, and that there are few researches where the lung transplantation was considered for the silicosis patient, and they do mention that at the six month, one year, and 
history yeah, mortality, mortality was uh, survival was very high it was about 76% 86% and then 84% you know this is three year survival of 80% i find it really? uh, after after causes yeah, yeah transplantation so i think it's a very interesting question and i think my answer will be yes because a the damage is mainly in the lungs the other organs are largely preserved and therefore you have otherwise a preserved patient musculoskeletally uh, hemodynamically everything else is preserved so if all that is looked after and the patient is fit candidate and is only fired his lungs away just because of its exposure i think he's a good candidate i think uh, i think it's one of the best compensations a government can offer is to have offer a free lung transplant to these people mm-hmm. because they are they have worked and fired their lungs away isn't it so it's it's possibly one of the best things that can happen to these people theoretically yes practically we still have to wait for our first success stories and eventually you know i think we are just about 2000 transplants sold in this country so it's not too many transplants done and uh, therefore we at this point in time are doing it for interstitial lung diseases but this kind of diffuse parenchymal lung diseases which are coming from occupational lung exposure are equally deserving i feel unless until there is a contraindication for example there is a malignancy obviously i mean that will go away so a yeah, presence of mesothelioma i would be a little uh, scary that even if i have a effusion and i don't know what it is then i will be a little worried whether i will do a transplant or not but if it is only purely lung da- lung damage then i think these are good candidates for bilateral lung transplant isn't it uh, sir uh, sir yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah anyway. just just now quickly i was checking uh, while we were discussing this question very interesting yeah uh, there is a 2021 journal report which says that in the us Uh, they checked the uh, lung transplants which were done between 1991 to 2018 wow right and <laughs> and and this this is only for those uh, the uh, occupational lung diseases which included all the which we are dis- discussing including anemocon uh, coal workers yeah. pneumoconiosis silicosis 230 were the total yeah and they have all shown good prognosis and imagine in a country like us in 1991 to 2018 such a huge range of you know time only 230 so yeah. i think as you rightly said yeah. we we will have to look in we'll future look. and then, yeah no, so i think you know on their own as i don't see them affording it i don't see them affording it at all because uh, the, the way you know you know if you really see who is undergoing lung transplant in india today is somebody who can dole out 35 to 40 lakhs out of his pocket at least 20 25 lakhs out of his pocket and or insurance or whatever it is and that does not belong to these coal worker coal workers or you know people who are exposed to silica so i think some kind of a package or some kind of a methodology you know rather than giving the son a job or a daughter a job i think i would rather offer these guys younger and they can go back to life and live as at least 15 20 years because the prognosis is good if you if you look at the survival it is good but the numbers are very small because again they come from the very very low social economic strata where the affordability is the issue the post uh, transplant care is the issue so many so many hurdles that they have to cross uh, dr tridip chatterjee who has been our forever attendant he asked from maharashtra mumbai what are the modern occupational cause occupations causing to, to uh, asbestosis so is there a hidden as best as somewhere in the modern occupations trigun sir if you can want to take that yes, or yes, anybody yes. Yeah. some something uh, some new things are being uh, promoted and uh, uh, job as far as concerned more recently it has been used in cement pipes portable yeah. water in gasket kit, uh, gaskets and in friction uh, materials uh-huh. including brake lining brake oh, lining brake lining roofing and floor products so they are the increasing in the use of asbestos they are leading to asbestos they are the some modern things wow sir so, even this even in some of the ship building industries and aircraft yes yes they, they they are, yeah yes and and i i think somewhere i had come across that even cosmetic and soap hmm. industries so there also it is there so i mean these sir, are all in, modern in, things that initially it was ship yard manufacturers were suffering from asbestosis but now the modern days the i have what i have mentioned yes, is yes. the new new things were cutting asbestosis even brake linings are creating asbestosis okay great 
very important i think all of us have to be you know with our sort of uh, uh, you know like like we say hypersensitivity pneumonia we look for those mold yeah. for pigeons we look for all the minutest causes is your air conditioner uh, serviced or not you know those kind of minute questioning we go into so when it comes to pneumoconiosis you have to go into those minute questions in fact one of the one of the things which i do for my hp protocol protocol sort of kind of thing i wouldn't say a protocol because i don't made it compulsory but i encourage my patient to take a 5 minutes video of their entire home and surroundings and come back to me and some, very often we find something which is going wrong there it's a bird or you know is something which they are forgotten to tell you that uh, you know or it's a mold on the wall so one way or the other said even in pneumoconiosis i think their workplace videos may be of importance of course uh, regulations have to be followed we can't uh, shoot everything and show it to everybody but i think if that is doable for for a doctor patient uh, sharing i think that should not be a big problem so it is worth doing it tridip asks one more question and this is again interesting i really don't know the answer if somebody if any of you knows the answer he ask uh, will you call an occupational obstructive airway disease like baker's asthma type of pneumoconiosis any anybody any from anybody from the panel yes dr tigun sir some uh, occupational disease produce symptoms like obstructive airway in some where in silicosis also be find uh, symptoms like obstructive airway disease something like vicinosis so yes in yes. that condition we can label as occupational obstructive airway disease we can yeah. label of course sir yeah so it's an occupational airway disease but not a no, true pneumoconiosis because no, there no, is no no it not direct damage it's not a true pneumoconiosis isn't it okay. i mean yeah okay uh role of immunomodulatory drugs dr shubham sharma from delhi again he asked role of immunomodulatory drugs and antifibrotics million dollar question all panelists i want your view on this yes ambika ambika so the antifibrotics you. like serpenadon and entadenib there are no human studies yes published for silicosis or uh, you know uh, pneumoconiosis patients so because there are no uh, human studies so we are ideally not able to use these drugs but i i guess if some kind of antifibrotic comes for this patient and it works then it will be great so i think animal studies are going on so there are the, there are details about some drugs uh, trying on animals about uh, even for the silicosis other the inhalational aluminum or some polymers have been tried on the animals they have been not successful there also so they are not the so similarly antifibrotics are also are, are going to be tried yes. yes so antifibrotic at the moment not available for the okay. silicosis point of view yes so prova sir i saw two studies where pneumoconiosis is having the uip pattern mm -hmm. so they divided it into pa fild versus the ipa fild so there mm -hmm. was uh, like two studies on that antifibrotics but mm -hmm. even in that study they didn't find any significant role of antifibrotics and pa fild mm -hmm. where diffuse interstitial uh, interstitial fibrosis was around 40% and rest maybe some nodules this pneumoconiosis nodules so that is again the another point uh, because uh, as a they assume that maybe fibroblast pro proliferation is there but the mechanism is something different Indifferent. so that is why uh, maybe antifibrotic still not proven any role so and corticosteroids time to time uh, just symptomatically have been used in this patient but they not, don't uh, they significant just don't work. they just don't work i mean if at all they invite infections or tuberculosis or one way or the other so i I'm, i'm very very reluctant to put people on you know steroids when when it when it comes to these diseases already yes when already fibrosis is being started no point and said so, dr mees uh, i am going to ask you a question which is not really related to this but it has come from the audience uh, dr poni tarora from delhi he is asking can you a long exposure to uh, and radiology in, including ct scan that does not show classical findings should we do any uh, do or anyone has done tblbs to assist the patients in getting a compensation so i think uh, i mean doing a biopsy on these patients will it be of importance and i i think i partly answered that 
Uh, because yeah, we yeah. If, if, if we do a diagnosis and uh, tell that the patient is it is a pneumoconiosis, then it becomes better for, as Dr. Animesh was saying, that it is it, it becomes easier for the compensation. Absolutely. It same happens in silicotuberculosis also. When when a patient of silicotuberculosis dies of tuberculosis, if we if we document it as a death of tuberculosis, then as Dr. Animesh was saying, so it is the same thing. If we are able to diagnose as a pneumoconiosis, as yes, patient will get. Uh, composition. Yes, I think I, I, I agree with you. So I think with that, uh, I think we are nearly at the end of questions. So I want each of you last one minute, everybody, your conclusions, concluding remarks, summary, whatever you want to say, say goodbye, whatever it is. So we'll start with uh, Trigun, sir. Sir, uh, in fact, what we can say about occupational language or pneumoconiosis is if it's a a uh, very sad part that it has very poor prognosis. Even in case of malignant mesothelioma, survival time is 8 to 10 months, or less than 20% of patients see that for a two year survival rate. So yeah. it is so a pathetic condition. And right. that too that is a condition of poor person, laborer who works in coal mine or in sandy areas for us. So our tribute to them, them uh, their effort is to provide self atmosphere by modifying some problem, uh, some way, like wet, wet, wet environment or tunneling the dust, or uh, we can say that providing their safe mask or respirator so that there, there will real need to do, uh, those workers who are working for us. Absolutely. I think. Ambika, over to you. Um, so I, I, I ended my slide also with this that prevention is better than cure and you know we we know this is an ancient time uh, uh, disease you know uh, silicosis is from our evolution and uh, so uh, what is there that we can prevent it all measures should be implemented to prevent it and i wish there like in scientifically and uh, in medically if we can find a drug for these patients because we at the moment doesn't have any drug and we really feel pity that we are just giving supportive care to them and not curing them, sir. Yes, sure. Uh, Suprava. Yeah, sir, uh, as I discussed, like tracking these patients are uh, really a big problem because there is a, a shifting in the workforce in these mines and places also. Nowadays, in coal, uh, coal mining areas, there are contractual uh, labors or more. So they are not getting the you know tracking or the benefits uh, per se. So uh, maybe later on we we won't be able to track or see those cases. So it is just uh, to enhance Krishna sir. And if we create uh, such you know panel that somebody getting those bizarre old X-rays, and if we can uh, you know keep it up and share just the learning purpose and for the awareness purpose, that can be a great thing, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. I think having a group meeting and reviewing these kind of pneumoconiosis scenarios on a regular basis may be a way forward to at least help these pe poor people out. Yes. Because the, you know having an online meeting doesn't really cost much, and you know having yes. and sharing uh, those thought processes can be a great way forward. So a very very nice suggestion. Thank you, Thank you for that, Dr. Uh, Thank Thank sir. Uh, uh, I think, sir, this is uh, it is it's a great it was a great um, uh, talk. I think with with uh, more, um, uh, around about thousand logins on pneumoconiosis. I think if I I I don't remember any any other talk like this any other. So it uh, because this disease is not talked much. So yeah. if if we, I think kudos to CCI, kudos to all all of you, and kudos to Dr. Nitin. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, uh, thousand people listening to us. I think that's 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 the best thing. It, no, it no, my job was message. my job was the easiest. Asking questions is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so so it, it makes people aware if they if, if, if these these webinars make people aware that these are the diseases that we that that common people or poor people are facing. So I think kudos to CCI, kudos to Dr. Krishna, and kudos kudos to you, sir. And I take my I take this uh, opportunity to invite you to Kashmir, sir. Sir, you make Absolutely. up your mind. Give me a call. I'll be it will be a pleasure to host you, sir. Next week, you might find me there. <laughs> Inshallah. 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 Please, sir. Please, sir. Uh, last but not the least, Animesh. Uh, I think because you, ha you, you have some kind of roadmap for us. So let's hope you give us that. Not really, but yeah. But what I, I mean, obviously, I think it's already been talked about. The prevention is better than cure. I would have said that. But I re-emphasize, 
more than that i think we also and i said this in one of my slides also towards the end i think there are two things i want to emphasize other than prevention prevention is the only way especially when it comes to any kind of pneumoconiosis because as of now we all know that there is no cure as such but more than that we don't have enough research and i i have always been a proponent of research Absolutely. at whatever level even if it's a case series case reports let's start doing that and second thing would be creating awareness now how do we go about it so start with different ways one is within our physician communities we we have our own forums you may have you know like we have a respiratory chapter in mango we have ima why don't have you know at least annually once have a meeting where you talk about this yeah. it it is good to diffuse knowledge between the you know peers so that's very important secondly try and hook up with ngo or somewhere we can actually help them to reach out to these people and the third thing is even the employers they need to be aware they have some some kind of you know uh, social responsibility of course it's a business but then they also have some social responsibility and moral obligation so that legislations will be there they will have their own course and all that but these are more important things yes and very importantly till we eradicate poverty or at least eliminate poverty yes it's not going to happen because absolutely jab, jab because pet pe aag lagti hai to people can do it kaam karna padega yeah kaam karna hi padta hai and that's the worst thing so that's that's i think something which is the crux of the situation whether it's here or brazil or anywhere else that's what happens yeah. so i think we have to look yeah. at that Brilliant welfare brilliant. measures Absolutely. So that's all I have. I don't have the roadmap as such, but these are some of. The no, I think I think this is better than a roadmap. This is a this is the way forward. That you know everybody who is working, in general, uplifting the quality of life, their earnings, their affordability, all this will make them think about their rights and responsibilities. Right now, they are only looking at their responsibilities towards their family, and then they are putting their life in the risk. But you know if 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 they start thinking about it then they will think am i exposed am i exposed to this am i exposed to that what is the exposure level what kind of risk and all these will go in long way in preventing the diseases automatically because the moment i say i need a mask without a mask i will not go in in fact uh, you know last 3 years 3 years ago we never imagined a mask was a reality today all the patients sitting in my opd are wearing a mask and if we even if just just politely remind them to put the mask up they will do it even if my mask is down so i think if awareness and a, a little bit of fear i think also thoda sa dar dar bhi to dalna chahiye to do no bina bhi to dar ke bina kuch nahi hai so i think thoda sa dar bhi to hona chahiye ki you know there will be something going wrong with me if i don't do it and i think that needs sir, to be sir sir and just to, part of education that's a part uh, of just education. the dar se yaad aaya of course only fear will not work i i i absolutely take that point that you know that desperacy of ki that i have to work i have to work that's a different story but once i know that i have reached a certain level at least a lower middle class level and then there then people do think of their rights not just their responsibilities or their you know their the necessities so i think thoda thoda level wo upar aa jayega rights automatically aa jayenge and then then the doctor saying something will be heard right now they are not in a capacity to really hear you because in simple words they are not not even none of none of us is consulting people on preventive basis that you don't go and work in this particular way without a, a n95 respirator mask nobody is doing that so i think i think that that message will be only heard when somebody goes above a certain financial or a, a socio economic level then only that message is going to be heard so i think both those things are possibly the uh, combination uh, end message from my side uh, if there is any no further remarks from anybody then i think we say uh good bye to everybody you sir, sir, just just one quick one quick thing please sir yaad aaya see now we have these you must have seen that you know public service or public awareness messages on lung cancer because of cigarette smoking yeah and they show us you know some of those live visuals or even the we can think of some case studies of these workers yeah and that can be aired as well maybe we can think of it from cci forum or something i mean just the thought because you said about dark Yeah. because that also works 
so not as a dirt but at least an awareness awareness yes. even if it is not not scaring people away but at least making yes. them aware i mean that's that's and, the and then how to prevent a very short one you know couple of minutes that's it absolutely and 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 somebody endorsing it from a you know a film industry would be even better so <laughs> the message is even stronger and reaches much much wider so i think let's let's hope that happens over a period of time and with all this i think no more to say a uh, warm goodbye to everybody have a good evening and thank you for that thousand near thousand logins so i think fantastic dr krishna sir hats off to you again and uh, with that goodbye from my side and we close thank this session thank you very much thank you good thank night good night thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.